Hello and welcome to our latest Insider interview. Today I'm joined by Job Curtis, Fund Manager of the City of London Investment Trust. Job, great to see you again. It's a pleasure. So Job, could you firstly explain how City of London Investment Trust invests? You mainly stick to the FTSE 100 index and you focus on dependable dividend payers. So what sort of qualities are you looking for in a company? Well, first, I should say the investment approach is valuation led, and it's crucial to me to be in shares on a reasonable valuation, which reflects the prospects. But when it comes to the companies, I'm looking for consistent companies. And those sort of companies will often have some attributes like very strong brands or very good market leading position, which means their, their profits are very defendable. But it's very important the companies are also investing themselves enough for the future, making enough capital expenditure on plants and equipment or their brands, because unless they're investing enough for the future, they, you won't get the future growth. So that's, that's a very important part of it. I should also say I prefer companies with strong balance sheets. The, those companies are much more resilient when times are tough and you know the economy is turning down. In that type of situation, companies that are highly indebted are going to be more at risk. In particular, they might well be under pressure to cut their dividends. And when you're investing in dividend paying companies, what do you do if a dividend is then cut? When we last spoke last summer, you mentioned Direct Line was one of your holdings. The firm at the start of this year unexpectedly cut its dividend. So what did you do? Yes, well, sometimes um, when a dividend cut happens, you know, it can be after a period of share price underperformance. And you know, if you actually sold out of the stock, you'd be kind of throwing out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak, and um, doing it at the worst possible moment. But in the case of Direct Line, we've reduced the holding quite substantially and so sold more than half our holding because there are other kind of companies in insurance and financials generally which are carried on paying and growing their dividends, which is so, um, so are kind of in the short term, you know, more help to us. But Direct Line has got very good recovery prospects, in my opinion. It is a kind of leading insurer in motor and property insurance in the UK and it's got a very strong brand. So I, I was I didn't really want to sell out of it entirely. So we've kept a, a smaller holding. I mean a good example, of course, with dividend cuts was of course in the pandemic there were a lot of dividend cuts. And um, you know, I think particularly of Shell, which cut its dividend for the first time since the Second World War, but by two thirds, which was a massive dividend cut at the time. And we we did reduce Shell, but we switched into Total Energies, which is the French listed International oil company, which came into that crisis rather better position than Shell, and um, as a result, didn't have to cut its dividend. And so, with the kind of recovery in the oil price subsequently, we have kind of benefited from having Total, and we kept um, a decent position in Shell. So we we didn't kind of lose out, given that although it was a very difficult period immediately after the dividend cut, it you know it has actually had enjoyed quite a good recovery subsequently. Also, when we spoke last summer, you mentioned that you were taking a closer look at the mid and small cap stocks given that um, share prices had fallen quite notably in some cases in response to interest rates going up. Have you been adding to that area? Yes, I've been trawling around, but actually I haven't found all that much from our perspective that sort of meets our cr criteria. So really our proportion in the large companies is, is similar to where it has been. We've got about 10% in medium and small UK companies. But, you know, I have found... Um, some instances that we've made a new investment in a couple of companies which you could say are materials technology that's a company called Vesuvius and a company called Morgan Advance these are British companies medium-sized companies which are kind of leaders in in what they do they're, they're very global I think they're quite undervalued um, and I think they'd be more highly rated if they were on an overseas stock market and I've also invested in the alternative um, fund space in a company called Round Hill Music which owns music royalties and um, that area the market's seen some sharp share price falls and it's on quite a big discount to its underlying asset value in my opinion and you're seeing a lot of growth in that area with the growth of streaming. You've just mentioned Round Hill. Are there any other investment trusts that you have exposure to? Uh, well the only other one is 3i which is in the FTSE which is um, the largest um, uh, and it's a, it, it really is um, purely in private equity and, and they've had a particularly successful investment in a um, retailer, discount retailer in continent Europe called Action, which has been a spectacularly good investment. So actually 3i Group over the last 12 months has been one of our best investments. So among the FTSE 100 listed companies where the majority of the portfolio is invested, what have been the newest holdings? Well, we bought last summer um, NatWest, the, the leading UK bank, which, um, you know, is, we think the dividend stream is going to be 
uh, very attractive. And so that that um, we will, we've got some existing holdings in the banking sector. I mean, we're still slightly underweight relative to the index in banks, but we think the conditions for banking are quite good at the moment. And um, more recently, we've um, made a switch in the mining sector. So this is um, this year, in 2023, we've um, switched out of BHP with the Australian, well, it was 50% listed in the UK, it's now become 100% Australian listed. Um, it's done very well for us over the years, um, but it's very um, biased towards iron ore. It's kind of over half the profits come from iron ore, which is a key component in steel making. And the, the predominant demand comes from China. And um, we think the outlook there is somewhat uncertain. And whilst Glencore, which is 100% UK listed and is um, is quite well positioned for some of the uh, metals for the future. I mean, 37% of their profits come from copper, for example, which I'm going to need a lot of copper going forward with all the electrification talk, talked about. And in addition, Glencore's got a very um, world-leading commodity trading business. It's around 20% of profits, and we think that's quite a good quality business. So uh, that's a new holding for us um, and replaces BHP. Investors are having to contend with a very different macroeconomic backdrop compared to the past decade or so. So inflation is at a very high level. Interest rates have been going up to try and cool down inflation. There seems to be a growing consensus that those interest rate rises could be higher for longer. What's your view on that and how does it impact how you select stocks? Yes, I think obviously we had a lot of monetary stimulus in, in the um, pandemic and as well as fiscal stimulus, with, you know, the furlough scheme, etc., which was all necessary at the time. But it that and the supply disruptions with the Russia invasion of Ukraine have, have kind of let much higher inflation than we've been used to for, for a long period in the UK and, and, and in other countries. And in addition, we've got a very tight labour market still and, and and we have a second order effect of wages um, continuing to, you know, wage increase, which people obviously need to keep up with the cost of living. So um, overall, we, you know, it is a, a situation back to sort of more like what we had in the kind of 1980s, you know, much higher and before 1970s, much higher inflation. And I I'm certainly believe that... Um, interest rates are going to sort of stay higher than people have expected for longer. But um, but I think obviously some of the features we had in the 70s, like very powerful trade unions, aren't, you know, aren't here this time around. So I think inflation will start to come down. In particular, some of those energy price increases come out of the 12-month equation. So, so I do see inflation heading down, but it is stickier than a lot of people first assumed. I mean, I think it's certainly, you've got to be careful as I was saying really are companies that are highly indebted you know if companies you know got a lot of debt they're going to at some point pay much higher interest rates on on that debt as 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 some that their loans come up so i think that's one area to be wary of i mean there are other parts of the market which can benefit from higher interest rates i mean i mean one particular area is um you know pension funds can de-risk their pension funds by moving into bulk annuities and the some of the big insurance companies provide that service for them. So a company like Legal in General, which is the leader in that area, you know, will, will have very good business prospects, you know, as a result of um, the, the new interest rate environment um, in, in that particular area. So so there are also opportunities out there, but uh, also certainly things to be wary of. And are there any other sectors or types of companies that you would highlight that are potential beneficiaries from a higher for longer scenario for interest rates? Yes, as I mentioned, I mean, quite a few of the insurance companies do benefit from from higher interest rates, um, you know, in terms of their solvency ratios. And the banks also, to to to, to some extent, um, it means they can price their deposits much more easily. I mean, they certainly, you know, when interest rates were virtually zero, it was very difficult for them to offer, you know, bank deposits any kind of interest rate. Whilst now they can offer a proper interest rate and they can manage the, the margin between what they're lending at and the deposit rates more easily. So, it should be a good environment for the banks. I mean, if the economy tips into a big recession, although the banks are much stronger than in terms of their capital ratios than they were pre-financial crisis, it still will not be good for the banks, their leverage institutions. So it's a kind of, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be sort of 100% confident, but but in some respects, certainly the some respects, it could be slightly better conditions for the banks. And as you've mentioned, I mean, the, the big danger is that these interest rate rises tip the economy into a recession. In that scenario, would you be wary of investing in consumer-facing companies? Yes, we, we've, we're, we're fairly um, low in consumer, what you might call consumer discretionary stocks. Um, and I mean, they're obviously going to be affected. I mean, obviously, a lot of people are on, most people are on fixed mortgages for over two years. So it takes a while for these interest rate 
increase the feed into the economy. But I think certainly retailing also has sort of still has quite big secular pressures from the growth of online shopping. And it, it's still, I mean, it's been a big adjustment that's taken place, but it's still putting a lot of pressure on retailers. I mean, travel and leisure has had a very strong period um, as people kind of sort of go back on holiday again after the enforced um, stay at home during the pandemic. But I think that could be another area that could be a bit vulnerable and we're quite light in, in travel and leisure stocks. Job, thank you for your time today. It's a pleasure. That's it for this episode. Hope you've enjoyed it. Please do like, comment and subscribe and I'll hopefully see you again next time.